and when you think of baptism. But I do know that we come from a lot of different backgrounds, and so we're probably not all thinking exactly the same thing when it comes to this whole idea of baptism. So I just want to stop and talk about this for a few minutes this morning, and talk about why this matters, why this is important, and why we do what we do here at Trailhead Church. Now, actually, the way that we do baptisms is a little different than the way that I grew up experiencing baptism. I don't know um, if any of you have an experience like this, but I grew up in the South. I grew up where um, the church that I went to was about 10 times the size of Trailhead. Um, and, and the first thing that they made you do, if you wanted to be baptized, um, you had to come down front. You had to walk down the aisle in front of everybody and let them know that you wanted to be baptized, right? And probably the most awkward part of that was when you got down front. Um, I mean, not only were you standing in front of all these people, uh, but then you have to have a conversation with your pastor. And that's what we do, you know, because that's just some old guy out there. You don't really want to talk to him. It's like, I just want to get baptized. Please don't talk to me and try to be my friend, okay? Um, and so that's, that's kind of my experience as a kid, you know, was not only did you have to do that and go through that, that ordeal where you walk down front, but, but then they would make you wait a couple weeks. And then they would make you come back up front again and get in the water and get baptized. And so for a kid that was an introvert and didn't want to be in front of people, coming up front not only once but twice and then getting back, that was a somewhat traumatic thing, right? It was good. It was awesome. But it was somewhat traumatic at the same time. Um, and so maybe that's part of what you think of when you think of baptism. I don't know. Maybe, maybe your experience in baptism was totally different. Uh, maybe you think of... I wish I could remember that because, you know, maybe you were a child and kind of like when you got a shot after you were born, everybody told you, yeah, you got the shot, but you just don't remember it. And maybe that's how baptism was for you. Your parents took you to church as an infant and, and they took you to a church where, where you were sprinkled and that was considered your baptism. And so maybe you don't have a, a you know, much of a point of reference for baptism other than, than as a parent taking a child. Um, to, to the church. So, what is the point of this? Why do we do this? Why do we, on Sundays like this, bring this special little pool out here with a nice rolling looking overcoat or whatever it has and, you know, put the water in there? Why? I mean, honestly, if you just think about this, this is weird. I mean, just, just think through it. How many of you have said in your lifetime, I'll do this with my clothes on, but I really want to gather a bunch of people together so that I can go take a bath in front of them. <laughs> no, we don't do that, right? That's not normal. So, so there's got to be some reason why this is happening, right? There's got to be something that if, if people throughout the history of the church have always done this, there's got to be some reason that we're doing this, something that is kind of fulfilling in us um, in, order to, in order to keep practicing this, this thing that we call baptism. And so that, that's part of the question that we're going to answer, try to answer for you this morning as we look at Scripture. But, but all of us, if, if you've been baptized, you know that you were baptized hoping to have something fulfilled. In, in some cases, in some churches, in some, some areas where they, they teach this way, maybe you, you had kind of the understanding that if I come and I'm baptized, then I'm good with God. And that's kind of what you're hoping to fulfill, so that when I get to heaven, you know, God's not going to look at me and say, hey, you were a great person, and I really enjoyed the prayer times that we spent together, but you didn't, you didn't get wet in front of everybody, so you can't come in. I'm sorry. You know, maybe, maybe that's what you're hoping to fulfill, that, you know, make sure, whatever I have to do to make sure, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe it's more of, I just want to make sure that, I'm doing what Jesus did. I know he was baptized, and so I want to follow in his footsteps. And that way. Maybe it's, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to let the world know what God is doing in me, and that's kind of what you're hoping to fulfill through baptism. But whatever it is, all of us have motives, right? There's a motive for doing this. Otherwise, you wouldn't get in this little, this little you know, bathtub in front of everybody else and get wet. That's just weird. Um, and so, as, as we talk through this, more, and I hope that you'll see what our motives are here at Trailhead and why we do this, and maybe this will help you have some understanding of, of what this means in our lives as we're baptized. So I want us to, to look at a passage together to help us understand this in the book of Romans. I mean, it's been a little while since you've been there. Find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 
And then two, two more books, Acts and Romans. All right, Romans chapter 6 is where we're going to hang out for a little while today. Before we just jump in, let me, let me just remind you of what's going on as we get to Romans chapter 6. So Romans is a kind of interesting book um, because it, it's really a letter. And as you guys probably know, most of the books of the New Testament are actually letters that are written to churches. And, and for the most part with these letters that are written by a guy named Paul, he's writing to churches that he helped start. So he writes to a church in Corinth. He writes to a church in Ephesus. He writes to a church in Galatia. All these letters he's sending back to churches that he helped start. But he was like one of the founding pastors of the church. And he's writing letters back to them to encourage them to keep walking in the way that they had been taught to walk in. And well, the, the, the letter to the church in Rome is totally different. Because as far as we know, um, there was no apostle or disciple that went to Rome for the purpose of starting a church. It just kind of happened. <laughs> uh, apparently what happened is uh, there, were, there were certain days of the year where Jews were encouraged to come to Jerusalem. In fact, God said, hey, I want you to come worship. On these three weeks of the year, I want you to come to Jerusalem to worship. Every male Jew, I want you to come to Jerusalem. So he said, I want you to come to this place to worship. Um, wouldn't it be kind of nice if God said, hey, I just want you to come worship in this place three times a year. That's all you have to do. You don't have to do the other, you know, 49 weeks of the year. You're just three weeks of the year, right? Now, that's, you know, that's the way that God started relating to the Jews. He said, I want you to come three weeks out of the year to celebrate these feasts. And one of the feasts was a feast that was known as the Feast of Weeks. And I know you may, this is where you fall asleep, right? Okay, let's go talk about this. What, what that ends up becoming later on is what we know as Pentecost. And so what would happen is these people from all over the Middle East who were Jews would travel back to Jerusalem to come to the temple to celebrate the Feast of Week. Well, in this particular year, one particular year, there was some big stuff happening in Jerusalem. It was kind of where it was kind of getting to the other Jews around about this guy named Jesus. Um, and he'd been ministering to people, he'd been healing people, he'd been doing all this incredible stuff. Um, and all of a sudden, Jesus is killed, and then he's raised from the dead, and he appears to his disciples, and he appears to hundreds of other people. And so, you know, when that happens, people kind of talk a little bit, right? If somebody in Wellington died and then came back to life, we would probably be talking about that. You know, that's what happens in Jerusalem. Um, and, and so that's happening during this time where all of these people are coming into town to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. Um, they come in. It, it's an amazing time. They get confirmation of what's happened with this Jesus guy. And all of a sudden, uh, a guy named Peter starts preaching. And it says that the Holy Spirit came down on these people. And 3,000 people decided to follow Jesus that day. That's a pretty big church to start off with, right? 3,000 people decided to follow Jesus, and they were filled with the Spirit of God. So eventually, those people who had come in from Rome get back on a boat. They head back to Rome, leaving Jerusalem. But now as they go back, they have this stuff stirring inside of them where, man, Jesus really did die. He really did come back to life. And God is doing something in me now that I can't explain. So they're experiencing all of this. They go back to Rome, and they said, we don't know any other people who believe this whole thing. We know it's real. And so we need to get together and just celebrate Jesus. We need to get together and worship. And so that's what they did. They started just coming together, and they would talk about God, and they would look at the Scripture, and they would worship together. And there was not necessarily... You know, one pastor that's starting this church. It's just kind of a movement that God created. Um, and so that's what they did for 25 years. And then Paul, you remember Paul? He wrote a lot of this thing, right? So Paul eventually comes to the point where he wants to go see these people in Rome. And he wants to be a part of this church and, and encourage them. Um, but before he can get there, he writes a letter and sends it off to them and says, hey, these are the things that, that we know about following Jesus, and we want you to understand it. Uh, so he says, you know, we want you to understand how the church functions here as well. He, he starts giving them all of this instruction about who they are to be um, as believers of Jesus Christ. 
And as part of that, he talks a few times about what it means to be baptized and what it means to be a part of this whole worship process that we're doing today that's called baptism. So I want to look at what he said for just a minute um, is, the, is the heart behind this whole thing of baptism. And, and we're going to look at this passage in Romans chapter 6. Um, this is it's, it's one of those passages that if you just jump in in the middle, it's a little bit hard to understand. Um, but it's rich, guys. It is so good. And so we're just going to kind of hit, hit, hit the surface stuff here this morning. Um, but, but Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, this is Paul talking to the believers in the church at Rome. And he says this. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, before we press on beyond that, this is a verse that if you just take that those two verses and read it by themselves, you may come away thinking, what does he mean? How can we continue to sin? He's talking to believers. Um, if you want to know a believer who was baptized, who continues to sin, you know, I can give you a class, right? I think most of us would agree, just because I believe, just because I was baptized, that didn't take all the sin out of my life. That didn't take away all the dumb stuff that I do at times, right? Um, and, and so Paul is not saying here that when you become a believer, or when you're put into this water and brought back up, that you will never sin again. That's not what he's saying. Um, if that was the case, all of us would be messed up, right? Because every one of us that had been baptized have still sinned afterwards. Um, and so what he's saying is just really more along the lines of if you've been introduced to this brand new way of life, this Jesus way of life, why would you want to keep doing those things that you do? So it's kind of like, I mean, think about it. If, if you're trying to get to the other side of the wall, and for 10 years, you've been standing there beating your head on this wall, hoping I'm going to knock it down someday, right? This is kind of hurting me. I'm getting a headache, but I'm going to knock it down someday. Um, that's kind of what Paul is saying. He said, if, if, you, if you've been trying to knock this wall down with your head, and all of a sudden Jesus comes along, and he's kind of like a wrecking ball. He just knocks it down in one swoop. Why would you keep beating your head against that wall, trying the same old things, doing the same things you did before when Jesus has already taken? That's kind of what he's saying here. So he's saying we have a choice in this matter. We have a choice to decide if we're going to keep going down the sin path we've been going down, or if we're going to unite ourselves with Jesus and, and follow him as he leads us out of this. So that's that's where he started. Verse 3, he starts to connect this to what this looks like in baptism. All right, so he says this. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. We're going to talk about that in a second, so just hold that phrase in your mind. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. All right, so um, this, this part is a little bit disturbing if you just take it at face value. Um, he's saying we are being baptized into death. I don't know, um, you know, I'm just going to take a wild guess, and I'm going to say if I were to take a poll in here, uh, probably 99% of us would say, I'm not excited about dying yet. Maybe one day, you know, that's all going down the road, but today I'm not excited about that whole death thing. And Paul comes along and he says, if you want to understand baptism, you're going to have to understand that you're dying in this process. Typically, when we think of baptism, I think it's, it's just natural for us to some degree to say, I'm going to get baptized um, because I, I want to follow God, and then I'm going to live for God. Then I'm going to do great things for God. I'm going to get baptized, and that's going to be the gift, right? That's going to be kind of the line in the sand. Then I'm going to do great things for God. Um, but the problem here is that Paul is not saying you get baptized to do things for God. He's saying actually when you when you get baptized, you're dying with God. It's a with God thing, not a doing things for God. 
Um, so he says, you're really kind of making a voluntary choice here to die today. If you're getting baptized, that's what you're saying. I am ready to die with Christ today. I heard somebody talking about death one time, and this really just kind of connected with me and made sense to me. I've got a pretty simple mind, so hopefully this will make sense to you as well. So um, he was basically saying that the interesting thing about life is that when we are born, we come into, into the world screaming and crying, and we don't want to be here. It's kind of like, put us back. You know, I was warm. I was comfortable. I don't like this cold air. Um, and so we come into the world screaming and crying while everybody around us is celebrating and joyful. Um, and, and he goes on to say, um, if you get to the end of life, if you look at the end of a believer's life, it almost just flips because you get to the end of a believer's life and all the people around when that person died, all the people around, they're the ones that are crying and they're mourning, but the believer's going out celebrating because I've made it. I finally got to the point where I'm coming into the presence where I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And so he said there's this, this kind of flip that happens. It's ironic. We start out saying, I don't want to be here. We're crying and everybody else is celebrating. We go out. We're celebrating while everybody else is crying. But part of what Paul is saying here is he's saying you're coming into a voluntary death. But the thing is, it's a celebration for everyone. It's a celebration for the person that's being put under the water and coming back up because they are united with Christ. It's a celebration for everybody else around them because the body of Christ is getting stronger and because we are seeing what God is doing in the lives of the people around us. So this, this death that we are experiencing through baptism is a death of celebration. It's a death where we're saying we don't have to deal with the mess anymore if we don't want to. We get to live with Christ as a result of what he's done for us. Um, going on, verse, verse 5 is, I think, potentially um, the kind of the climax here. This is where we see what really matters and what baptism is all about. Okay, So in verse 5, he says, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him. In his resurrection. And, and right here, Paul gives us incredible clarity on what this whole baptism thing is all about. And I think as you think about um, baptism and being united to Christ, I think if we're honest, most of us would probably say, Yeah, I want Jesus in my life. But I kind of like some of the other stuff in the world too. <laughs> I want a little bit of Jesus, but I want a little bit of this other stuff with it as well, right? Um, that's the way that we pursue life most of the time. I want just enough Jesus so that I'm good, you know, and, and I make sure that everything is good with God. But, but I also want enough of this world that, boy, I'm happy right now today um, with whatever's going on. Because I've got the house, I've got the car, I've got the vacation, I've got the family, I've got the relationship, whatever it is. We have this... This tension here where we kind of say, I want a little bit of Jesus, um, and I want a little bit of this from the world. Paul is saying, what happens with baptism is this is where a person comes and they say, you know what? I want to be so close to Jesus. I want to be united with Jesus in such a way that everything else in life is second. I want to have a relationship with Jesus that's so intimate. I want to be united with him in such a way that I will choose him and suffering with him over anything else that the world would consider good. Because everything else is second. The job that I've always wanted, it's secondary compared to this relationship with Jesus. The money that I've always wanted, that relationship that I've been trying so hard to get and to keep it's secondary compared to this incredible relationship with Jesus. And, and again, he's talking about us being united to Jesus. So he's not saying that you get baptized and then you go do great stuff for Jesus. No, he says the whole thing of baptism is that you get to be with God. You get to be with 
God. And, and I was going to share this with you earlier, but I, I ran past it. So the, the big idea that I hope that you'll get out of this, um, and, and we'll continue to unpack this a little bit further in just a minute, but the big idea is that baptism doesn't lead to fulfillment after death. It brings fulfillment during life. Baptism doesn't lead to fulfillment after death. In other words, I don't get baptized today so that hopefully one day I'll stand before God in heaven and then I'll be fulfilled because I've got what I want and I got it in heaven. No, he's saying what happens is baptism leads to fulfillment today because today I am united to Christ, and that's better than anything else that the entire world has to offer. That is so much better than anything else I could get out of this world. And that, that's where Paul is taking us with this idea of baptism. He's saying, when people come to this place, when they get put under these waters and raised back up, they are making a statement about today. They are not making a statement about down the road after I die, way down in the future. No, they're making a statement about today. Today, I choose Jesus, and I know that is going to be the most fulfilling way that I could ever live is as I follow him. Uh, going on, let's just, let's just read through quickly the, the last few verses here. Verse 6 says, For we know that our whole self is crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. If anyone who has died has been free from sin. Again, just so you don't go off the, the rails here, it's really easy to say, wait a minute, I, I was baptized, I have not felt this freedom. I tend to keep falling back into the same thing. Um, he's not saying that sin's gone. In fact, if you go one word or one chapter further, in the very next chapter, you know what Paul says himself? He says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I keep doing those things. Um, in other words, he says, I keep messing up. He's saying, I'm not completely free of sin, but he's saying this, I do have a choice. Whereas previously I didn't have a choice, I just kind of did things. Um, he's saying now I have a choice as to whether I'm going to follow the way of Jesus because he set me free to do that. Or whether I'm going to keep banging my head on this wall trying to knock it out. You know? so, so he's making it really clear here um, that we are free from the power of sin. We have a choice to follow Jesus. Verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. So, in this verse, Paul kind of paints this picture and he looks at the death of Jesus. And he says, Do you know what this is all about? Jesus died as a result of sin. But do you know what he's doing now? He said, after he died to death, sin, now everything he does, he's living to God. It's about this relationship. It says, he, he went through this mess, he went through this torture, he went through this heartache, he went through this agony for us so that he could die in our place take the death that we deserve over the sin that we committed. And after that death, as he's raised back to life, what he does immediately after that is he lives to God and lives in relationship with God. Again, that's the picture of baptism. Right? If we are, we are coming and we're saying we are identified with Christ and that as he died, we died as well. Just as sin didn't have power over him any longer, he had a choice. We have a choice. Just as after he was raised back to life, he was united with the Father in his life and with the Father, we are doing the same thing. In, in verse 11, and Paul just applies it quickly by saying, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And as, as, as we look at this, as we have this time today where we celebrate baptism and celebrate this incredible act of worship, what we're doing is we're celebrating people that have come and that have said, you know what? 
you can have the world. You can have that stuff. Because I realize now that that will never compare to a relationship with Jesus. You can have houses, you can have a job, you can have the relationship, you can have all of that. It's secondary compared to how good this relationship with Jesus is. He says it, it's not it's not this thing where we're looking to the distant future when I die, then I'm gonna fill this this great fulfillment because I was baptized. No, he says I'm looking to today. <laughs> and there is kind of this line drawn in the sand. Where as I am united with Christ, that's where the fulfillment comes. So much greater than anything else in the world. You remember at one point in time Jesus talked about what he called the abundant life. You remember that? That I have come that you may have life and you may have it abundant. Um, guys, let me just tell you, there there are some some pastors that, that won't be honest about this, but that doesn't mean that. I've come so that you can have stuff and have it alone. <laughs> he wants something so much better for you. Because I've come that you may have life and have it one thing. And the only way that that works is if we are united with Christ. These people that are coming to be baptized today are coming to say, you know what? I believe in Jesus above everything else in life. I believe that Jesus is greater than anything else in the world. And I'm drawing a line in the sand to show that I'm not going to be perfect from here out. I'm not going to do great things for God, but maybe I'll do great things as I'm with God. Maybe He'll do great things for me as I'm with God. So this is the line in the sand that says that I'm choosing the life of being with Jesus because the life, even of suffering with Jesus, is better than any other. That's why we baptize people with trail heads. <laughs> because they're coming making that statement. Um, and so I hope that as we have this time of baptism today, it'll be a time of celebration. Um, this is, like I talked about a minute ago, this is one of those, those deaths that's not a death that you cry about, it's a death that you celebrate. And so in just a minute, as, as Brennan is baptized, he's going to be put under the water, he's going to be brought back up. And guys, this is going to be a moment that Brennan remembered. Um, and you know what I hope that you'll hear as soon as he's coming up out of the water I hope that you'll hear you clapping and excited because this is a celebration of a life that's being united with Christ to live an entirely new life uh, that's, that's what we're going to do in just a second so I, I want to um, I want to pray for us and then after I pray for us I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what God may be prompting in your heart this morning. So, so we'll do that and then we'll actually have a song that we'll sing in response and we'll allow all the kids that are in their classes to come and to celebrate this with us. So they'll be, they'll be coming in here to celebrate with us. But let me pray for us and then we'll continue in that direction. Father, we, we are so amazed by you. Jesus, we are absolutely astounded at the fact that you love us the way that you do. And you have You've gone to the cross that you have taken the punishment that we deserve because you loved us so desperately. And I pray that we will know that today. I pray that we will feel that today. And God, as Brendan comes in just a minute to be baptized, I pray that this would be a time that's not only memorable and encouraging for him, but I pray that it would be something that spurs all of us on. Say, you know what? I don't need the stuff of the world nearly as much as I need a relationship with Jesus. Father, I pray that the testimony of this young boy would be a testimony that impacts us, that we carry forward and that changes us. And help us to help us to see who you are through this picture of burial and resurrection. Help us to worship you because of that. Guys, before you raise your heads, before you open your eyes, I just want to give you a chance, and I've said, to respond to the things that we've been talking about today. We don't do this every week, and we don't do this all day. But I don't want to leave this place without giving you an opportunity to say, you know what? 
I've never done that before. I've never come to a place where my life was united with Christ. And, and I want to do that today. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to walk through the ground. I'm just going to ask that you would raise your hand so that I know how to pray for you if that's what's happening in your heart and in your life right now. We can talk about baptism later if you, if you want to be baptized. But I just want to know where you are so that I can pray with you. And just by lifting your hand, you're saying to God, God, yes, I'm ready to start following you in this way. So in just a second, I'm going to count to three. And as I count to three, you just slip your hand up. Your neighbor doesn't even have to know what's going on. I just want to give you a chance to say yes to God. He invites you to come walk and do life with him. This is the greatest life possible. The creator of heaven and earth. One who gets you together so I start. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. So I'm going to count to three, and when I count to three, you're ready to respond. You just did it. One, two, three. 